Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, Elena and Alex, for for inviting me to present a bit of the work I have done during my PhD at SpinTech. So I was there in the anti-ferromagnetic spintronics group. So I invite you to visit the group web webpage, so you can see the different projects uh, they are developing. I will show more the transport part, but there is also some uh, some research in dynamics of antiferromagnets and also nanomagnetism. So uh, here's a short outline of the, my presentation. I will go to a, a small introduction to show some specific specificities of spin transport in ferro and antiferromagnets. Then I will discuss uh, two different projects uh, uh, that I was uh, working with. So in general, uh, okay, everyone uh, is used to this concept of uh, uh, ferromagnets that are widely used in spintronics but they rely uh, for uh, application in, uh, in several properties of ferromagnets, but I would uh, highlight here the remanent state of the magnetization, which is beneficial for non-volatile devices, and also the possibility of switching it in hundreds of picoseconds, which allows uh, relatively fast uh, devices to, to operate. And when it comes to magnet resistive effect, in general, in ferromagnets, you have a large electrical response, which is uh, associated with the magnetization. And of course then, uh, the, the interaction of physical entities such as light, heat, or electricity with spins in uh, ferromagnets, they have been widely studied in the last uh, several years. But of course, there are also some limiting factors when it comes to device uh, performance. Uh, I would mention the instability due to the spurious magnetic field, the limit in the storage density due to the magnetic field uh, crosstalk between the devices, and the dynamics in the gigahertz range in ferromagnets, which limits the maximum uh, velocity of uh, switching. And then researchers, they uh, start to think about alternative uh, 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 options, and one of the possibilities use, consists in using antiferromagnets for, for spintronics, and in antiferromagnets you have two uh, opposite spin sublattices, and there are then several uh, specificities that come due to these, uh, due to these uh, properties. And then, uh, in, in, as it was uh, talked about already during this uh, workshop, in high symmetry uh, antiferromagnets, in general, we have a very small electrical uh, response, which is associated with the, lax, the, the lack of uh, magnetization, or of the net magnetization. But uh, recent advances in the frame of Antiferromagnetic uh, spintronics have shown that actually you can have also large uh, electrical response even though uh, the net magnetization is, uh, is small. And then this is very active now, uh, the, uh, consisting in, in probing the, 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 the interaction of uh, different physical entities with spins in, in antiferromagnets. And maybe most importantly, when it comes to device uh, uh, performance, they might bring some uh, advantages so, for example, the stability to external magnetic field, as antiferromagnets can only be ma manipulated with larger magnetic fields. The possibility of uh, higher density memory, because you don't have a uh, crosstalk between the devices. And the faster uh, dynamics, because intrinsically the dynamics in antiferromagnets is in the terahertz range. And there is more other uh, physical properties that are unique to, to antiferromagnets. And then on top of that, there are several uh, uh, possibilities concerning spin transport in antiferromagnets, and I want to discuss a bit of this in, during my talk today. So uh, in the first project, I want to, to deal with uh, charge transport uh, near spin textures. So in this case, we were uh, using the proximity effect with superconductors to probe, to, 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 to probe the penetration depth of Cooper pairs in an antiferromagnet. So I start here with a short introduction to proximity effect in, in, in ferromagnets. So in superconductors, sorry. Basically, in, when you have a, a superconductor, you have uh, Cooper pairs that cons consist of pair of electrons with positive spins. And you ha when you have an adjacent material, these Cooper pairs, they can uh, diffuse to the, to the adjacent material. And then the, the parameter here, imp the important parameter here is the coherence length of Cooper pairs that characterize the depth that the Cooper pairs can propagate in the neighbor material, which otherwise wasn't a uh, superconductor. And then when the, the adjacent material is a ferromagnet, you can have different situations. 
for instance, if the ferromagnet is in its saturated state, you expect suppression of superconductivity, basically because the Cooper pairs, they feel a homogeneous field from the, homogeneous exchange field from the saturated ferromagnet, and this, uh, this generates Cooper pair breaking, and then you have a loss or a decrease in the critical temperature compared with the, the uh, bare, bare superconducting layer. But in the other uh, side, you can have a demagnetized state in the adjacent ferromagnet, and in this case, you can partially suppress this, uh, this Cooper pair breaking because at the domain wall, the, the exchange field is rotating, and on average, the, the exchange field that is sampled by the Cooper pairs is reduced, and then you can re recover partially the critical temperature of your superconducting layer. So, and then I, here I show one typical measurement. So you measure the resistance uh, versus temperature for this kind of the layers, and you have either the ferromagnet sat, set to the saturated state or a multi-domain state, and you can see that for the case of the multi-domain states, the critical temperature is larger, confirming that the domain walls, uh, uh, they, they uh, suppress this uh, Cooper pair breaking, partially suppress this Cooper pair breaking. But in order to observe this effect, you need to adjust several parameters. For instance, the coherence length of the Cooper pairs uh, with respect for the domain and domain wall uh, sizes. So for this reason, uh, it's a bit difficult to, to adjust all these parameters together. So the maximum uh, temperature recovery that we can find in the literature is around 0.6%, and it prevents then to investigation that we were interested in, perform in performing. So what happens when you change gradually the magnetic state of the ferromagnet layer, and what happens when you insert an uh, uh, interlayer between the ferromagnet and the superconductor, how the how you can use it to probe the penetration depth of the Cooper pairs in this uh, interlayer uh, material. And then for, for this study, we started uh, growing this kind of structures. We have a platinum cobalt uh, multilayer with out of plane anisotropy as uh, the ferromagnetic layer. And in the other side, you have niobium nitride, a superconductor. We pattern these, the devices in this kind of hole bars. And then uh, by, uh, by doing some field cycling uh, procedures, we can see that for the same remanent uh, field, we can stabilize here in the bottom the demagnetized state of the ferromagnet, and here uh, on top the saturated state of the ferromagnet with the same uh, applied field. And then we prepare, previous to the uh, resistance versus temperature measurement, we prepare the ferromagnet in these two states, and then we measure the, the critical temperature for the two different states of the ferromagnet layer. And again, we see that, uh, as expected, the critical temperature is larger in the case where the ferromagnet layer is set to a multi-domain state. But what's more uh, important here is that we see a temperature recovery of the critical temperature of around 10%, and we attribute this enhancement to the fine adjustment of the Cooper pair coherence length in Niobium nitride with respect to the domain and domain wall sizes in the platinum cobalt uh, uh, multilayer. So after that, we, we, we thought that we could try to, to probe then the influence of the ferromagnetic domain configuration for all these intermediate uh, cases. So uh, we do this field, kind of field cycling to stabilize these different magnetic states in the ferromagnet. And then we measure the critical temperature for each one of these. And it results in this kind of, of curves. So here in the uh, right, we have uh, the full uh, demagnetized state with presence of domains and domain walls. And here we have the saturated state with uh, a single, uh, single domain. So we see that gradually changing the magnetic state of the, of the ferromagnet, we can uh, observe a recovery in the super con uh, superconductivity. But then we, we, we try to, to, to do the same kind of experiments for, for different number of repetitions of the platinum cobalt multilayer. And we see that this curve, they, it seems to have the, the, the same trend independent on the thickness of the platinum cobalt uh, multilayer. And then some uh, theoretician colleagues, they developed a model to try to explain these, the, these data and make some uh, qualitative uh, comparison with our, with our results. So basically they consider a quasi-classical diffusive model 
and then they consider that the Cooper pairs is uh, sample, sampling, sampling uh, uniform reduced exchange uh, field due to regular stripe domain. So it, it follows qualitatively uh, well our, our data, but it, it diverges here close to the saturation because basically when you are increasing a lot the size of the domains, it, it's not the, this assumption that you have periodical stripe domain doesn't uh, hold. And then the other thing that we wanted to do is to use, uh, to see what happens when you have a spacer layer between the ferromanganates and the superconductor. So in this case, we have uh, iridium manganese. And what happens is that, is that we see a reduction in the critical temperature as function of the spacer, spacer, of the recovery in the critical temperature, sorry, as function of the spacer thickness, basically because the Cooper pair, they have a finite penetration depth and when the iridium manganese layer in this case is, uh, is thicker than a certain number, the Cooper pair, they cannot uh, reach the, the ferromagnetic layer. And so we, we cannot promote uh, this partial recovery in the critical temperature. And by fitting this data, we can ob uh, obtain the, the coherence length for iridium manganese of uh, around seven nanometer. And as a comparison, we have something around uh, 12 nanometers for, for platinum. So uh, a short conclusion in this part. Uh, so we have used uh, Cooper pair transport to probe uh, the influence of the magnetic configuration on, on, on the re temperature recovery. And then we have used this uh, to, to, to measure the penetration depth in iridium manganese. Okay, so uh, the next project, so in the, in the previous one, we were dealing with spin textures, which are basically a inhomogeneity of the spin structure. And in this other project, we wanted to, to have some, uh, spin, uh, some charge transport, but really related to the spin structure it, itself. So this work is part of a big collaboration between several uh, institutions in France, uh, Germany, and Czech Republic. And this allows us to have a high quality samples to perform different kind of experiments and also for, for a theoretical framework uh, in our uh, results. I also invite you to check the, the, the seminar that Elena have uh, presented recently in the frame of these SPICE and SPIN plus six uh, seminars. Okay, so as, have, uh, as we have already seen the, during these uh, presentations here, so the, the chart how effects they were considered in the past to have two contributions, one from the, coming from the ordinary Hall effect and the other one from the anomalous Hall effect. And the, anom the anomalous Hall contribution have uh, extrinsic and intrinsic contributions. So the intrinsic contribution is related to the band structure and was described in terms of the Berry curvature. And then from, from the Berry curvature, uh, you can calculate some uh, intrinsic contribution to the, spin, to the anomalous Hall uh, conductivity. So, and to, ha to have a non-zero Berry curvature, one needs to, to, to break specific symmetries. And for instance, in the case of the anomalous Hall effect in ferromagnets, it's the, uh, the Z component of the magnetization that breaks time reversal symmetry. But then, uh, as it was discussed already, uh, the, the, it was expected from the symmetry perspective, it was expected that in high symmetry antiferromagnets, no, uh, uh, how effect would be observed. But actually the picture started to change recently with this advantage of uh, antiferromagnetic spintronics. So you can have uh, different kinds of time re reversal symmetry breaking. And you, you can have some uh, how contribution in non-collinear and non-coplanar antiferromagnets, but also in collinear antiferromagnets as Libor have presented on Wednesday in this case, uh, it, it comes from the uh, anisotropic antiferromagnetic densities uh, in this uh, ruthenium oxide, for instance. But uh, what I want to show is the experimental works where we have a measure, the experimental work where we have measured a spontaneous Hall contribution in manganese 5 silicon 3. But in this case, the, 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 the mechanism is slightly different and you have a multi subnatic spin, sp spin splitting that break time reversal symmetry in momentum in space. And uh, this, we have measured this in this collinear manganese 5 silicon tree uh, uh, material. So, so our colleagues, they have grown uh, this kind of uh, epitax areas of manganese 5 silicon tree on top of uh, silicon substrates by molecular beam epitaxy. 
So here I show one PM uh, microscopy uh, image of the, uh, the, the samples that show high quality. And we, by performing uh, XRD uh, diffraction, we have shown that we have hexagonal unit cell orientation, which is oriented in plane uh, of the, with the plane of the substrate. And then before doing the transport measurements, we prepare this kind of hull bars where we can measure simultaneously the longitudinal or transver untransversal uh, resistivities. And then from the transversal resistivity, we can identify uh, two uh, different phase transitions. Uh, first one from the paramagnetic state to a collinear state. And then in the low temperature, we have a second transition from the collinear to a non-coplanar, uh, which we attribute to a non-coplanar uh, state. But what you can see directly uh, from here that if you compare the, the transition temp temperatures uh, with polycrystalline uh, bulk samples from, from the literature, we see that we have uh, enhancement in the higher uh, critical temperature. In our case, we attribute this enhancement to the strain in the apitaxial uh, films that is preserving the hexagonal unit cell to low temperatures. And, and then it also uh, uh, stabilizes the anti-magnet order to up to higher temperatures uh, compared to the polycrystalline films uh, from, from the literature. And then we move to the uh, transversal resistivity experiments. So here I use the same color code uh, as before. So the collinear phase here on the, in the high temperature range, and then you have the non coplanar uh, uh, phase here. And you see that we have a, a spontaneous Hall effect that's domina dominating the signal in the whole uh, temperature range. So we can uh, work to separate a bit these signals. So this is the raw data. And in black here, we have the anti-symmetrized data to avoid any longitudinal contribution to the transverse signal. And from this, we can separate uh, it in com from coming from two signals, at least at, at 50 Kelvin, we have two contributions. One, which is this typical uh, bump uh, feature, typical from the topological Hall effect. And then on top of that, we have this large spontaneous Hall effect that I will discuss uh, in a bit. So by doing this separation for, the, for all temperatures, we see that uh, the Hall resistivity is actually dominated in, by this spontaneous Hall effect in the whole temperature range. And the topological Hall contribution arises only in the low temperature phase as expected from the literature, because in the low temperature phase, one expects this non-coplanar uh, non phase. And then we can, we have also checked how this spontaneous Hall contribution varies depending on the quality of our, our films. So here for different samples, uh, there is the, the, the Hall uh, conductivity as function of temperature. And you see that for all of the samples, we have the same trend, which is, that we have a non-zero uh, spontaneous Hall uh, uh, signal that persists up to 240 Kelvin. So it also uh, suggests that we have some magnetic order up to this uh, temperature. And we have obtained uh, these uh, spin Hall conductivity, uh, sorry, anomalous Hall conductivities in their range from five to 20 cms per, per centimeter. Then if you take now uh, the amplitude of the spin Hall, uh, the anomalous half resistivity at 150 Kelvin and plot it as function of the, the sample quality. So the sample quality here is, is indicated by the ratio between the manganese five silicon and, the, uh, and a manganese silicon spurious phase that can exist in our, our films. You see that the higher the quality, the higher quality is obtained for films with higher, uh, uh, with higher resistivity. Sorry, the contrary. A, a higher resistivity is obtained for films with higher quality. So, and then finally, uh, we have also done some uh, mag a lot of magnetization characterization of the sample, and you see here directly that we have a very small uh, net magnetization, and we don't have any uh, signal from the large coercive fields that we have ob observed in the transport measurements. So we, we cannot correlate really this uh, small magnetization with the, 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 the transport measurements. And also the magnetization does not uh, vary with crystal quality. And if we do a very rough estimation 
on these spoon funnels, how uh, contribution that you expect from this kind of uh, magnetization, you will end up with something that's more or less six orders of magnitude smaller than what we get uh, experimentally. So then, uh, this, uh, it, this was discussed by, uh, by Libor on Wednesday. So you can consider this material with this specific kind of uh, multi-sublight spin splitting that is opposed around these two magnetic valleys as shown here and here, for example. And if you do the, 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 the calculation of the, the, the anomalous Hall conductivity, you, have, you get something that's in the same order of magnitude, very similar values from the ones that we got experimentally. So uh, with this, uh, I would like just to conclude on, the, on this part. So we have experimentally measured this uh, spontaneous Hall effect in manganese 5 silicon tree, which is a very interesting material with uh, different ma uh, magnetic phase. We have a collinear and a coplanar phase at, at low temperature. And uh, it's, it, it's uh, very interesting because it, it, it also, it's a material with low atomic numbers and you have a collinear uh, magnetism. And uh, um, there is, a lot of perspectives in the frame of this magnetotransport uh, measurements in this material in the frame of this uh, consortium that I mentioned. So we believe that we can pre uh, prepare these antiferromagnetic analogs of the GMR and TMR. And also in the magnetotransport uh, experiments, there are some things going on concerning the anisotropy on the anomalous Hall effect and also attempts to measure the magnetic thermal electric uh, or the anomalous nearest effect in this, in this material. And with this, I'd like to conclude, and thank you very much.